ahead and get started. Um, on behalf of the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences at UCR, I'd like to welcome you to the first presentation of the 2014 Science Lecture Series. And I'd like to extend a special welcome to those of you who are in middle school and high school and, and there with your notebooks. That's great. Um, thank you for coming, too. Uh, I'm Mary Drosser. I'm a professor in the Earth Science <coughs> Department. And for those of you who have <coughs> been to the Science Lecture Series before, um, this year is going to be a little bit different. Uh, it is continued to be supported by the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences. But support this year also comes from the Department of Earth Sciences, the Office of Research and Economic Development, and from a new institute, the Ecosystem Dynamics and Geoecology Institute, or EDGE. And the institute is unique in that it brings together scientists from biological, earth, and environmental sciences to examine specific questions about life in a Earth's rapidly changing environment, both today and in the past. And you'll see for this lecture series over the next few weeks, this theme come up again and again. We'd also like to announce that the person who will be the director of this institute holds a newly endowed chair, the W.W. W. Mayhew Chair in Geoecology, which has been made possible by a generous donation of $1.5 million from the donors who wish to remain anonymous, but who are passionate about the ecology of the Southwest. And we're deeply grateful to these donors, especially for the commemoration of Bill Mayhew. And many of you know Dr. Mayhew is one of the founding faculty members at UCR, and he is one of three universities who established the three faculty, three people, who established the University of California Natural Reserve System, which is so important to the state and to the university. And so a search is underway right now for the director and the Mayhew chair. Um, and we expect to have somebody in place by next fall. So it's very exciting times for geoecology at UCR. So I'm particularly happy to have Terry Serling as our first speaker in the lecture series. Dr. Serling is a distinguished professor of geology at the University of Utah. He studies Earth's geochemical processes and the geological record of ecological change. His research includes the isotope physiology and diets of modern mammals, as well as the history of diets of different mammalian lineages extending over millions of years. He is a pioneer in using isotope records of bones and teeth and is an expert in the evolution of modern landscapes including modern mammals and their associated grassland ecologies. His talk is entitled Hair, the History of Animals Using Isotope Records. So please help me welcome Dr. Serling. Uh, thank you, and um, I'm going to see if I can manage to get, to get this thing to talk to everything we want it to. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to uh, talk today about uh, hair, actually real hair, and my acronym History of Animals uh, Using Isotope Record. Uh, the subtitle, You Are What You Eat Plus a Few, not percent, but per mil. So this is a notation we use in stable isotopes, and I'll, I'll explain that in, in a little bit. Um, but um, this uh, topic that I'm talking about started for me almost 20 years ago. I was working um, on, some other, on some other problems, and, and I ended up taking a trip that I thought um, could have some interesting observations, and I'll tell about that in a second. So what I'm showing on the first slide here is uh, two, uh, one, one, the guy on the, the uh, the lower left um, is my field assistant when I was doing some field work in Africa. And the, the men there have these wonderful hairdos. Uh, and on the right is myself uh, at uh, the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa with a piece of whale baleen. And uh, it turns out that the filter feeders, the whale filter feeders, have these long, uh, baleen plates, and they're actually composed of the same identical material as our, our own hair. And so what I'm going to do today is kind of explore this history. So it's not 
part of my geological life. It's really part of some of the biological um, problems that I've gotten involved in in the last few years. Um, so before I get too far, I'd just like to mention there's a, you know, a lot of people that I have to thank. Uh, these are postdocs, students, colleagues, even my two children who uh, you know, contributed samples and helped collect samples. And then uh, various um, uh, organizations have provided funding and samples and, and so on. So in science, we often kind of think about, well, there's, you know, the, an iconic thing that we all like to think we can do is, is get a, write a paper that makes the cover picture of some important science journal. And so a few years ago, we, we thought we reached the pinnacle of, 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 of this particular thing. We wrote a paper called The Cooperation and Individual of Among Man-Eating Lions. We made the cover of the Journal of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And those two particular lions uh, uh, did, did a number of things. One is that the, the guy who killed them, uh, Colonel Patterson, uh, wrote a book about it, The Man-Eaters of Savo. These are two lions roaming the African countryside 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, and they ate a lot of railway workers. It, it was the subject of the first three-dimensional movie, Buona Devil, in about 1950, so before the current generation of 3D movies. So we thought this was the sort of pinnacle movies, cover of PNAS and so on. And, and then, then a month later, we discovered we actually sponsored a New Yorker cartoon. So, <laughs> so a month after our paper, well, that, which that's the best you can do is if you can, if you can uh, get a New Yorker cartoon made after your science, then that, that's, a true, that's a true top. So I'm going to talk. My, my serious talk today is about several things. I'm going to call the first part a traveler's tale. And this is a trip that I took about 20 years ago that kind of got this whole genre of research started. Um, and we'll explain a little bit about you are what you eat and how that happens. And then I'm going to talk about a, a long-term project I got involved in looking at elephant ecology. And then I'm going to give you a little story about NCIS, which some of you think you know what it means, but what it really means is never contest isotope science. Hey, <laughs> isotopes never lie. So um, I'm going to give a little a primer here. So I, I, you know, see some people here in eighth and ninth grade, but this goes back even further to when, when you were in first or second grade, when you really learned what isotopes were. So I'll just remind you, uh, remember that you know, a nucleus in, in an atom has protons and neutrons. And we all learned the periodic table of the elements. I think you're all familiar with that. You know, to s some degrees of happiness. Um, and what I like to think of isotopes, there's a, there's a third dimension of the periodic table. So. Instead of thinking only about carbon in the periodic table, we have three forms of carbon naturally occurring on Earth. Carbon that has a mass of 12, carbon that has a mass of 13, and carbon that has a mass of 14. And all of you who you know, have picked up, helped move your colleagues up to the second or third floor of an apartment realize that the heavier boxes get left behind. So the same is true with isotopes. The heavier isotopes often get left behind. So a lot of life especially discriminates strongly against the extra work of carrying around this carbon-13, which is 10% heavier. So my story today is going to be about how we use these isotopes, these different forms of the chemical elements in particular carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen, how we can use these uh, sort of markers of the 
the elements themselves and learn about uh, the way natural systems works. So I'll emphasize that all of this is all natural. These are the natural variations that we're looking at. Um, for uh, carbon, um, the range, so the, the, the rare carbon isotope, carbon-13, uh, ranges on Earth from about 1.04 to 1.14 percent, a very small amount, and that's the space that we're working in. But we can measure this pretty easily in, in a lab that's set up to do this. And there's at least two labs on the UC Riverside campus here that can easily uh, do this kind of stuff. So it's, it's, it's not, not magic. Uh, the real magic is figuring out the fun problems to work on. So one important distinction on Earth is the distinction between plants using two different photosynthetic pathways. And they're called the C3 and C4 pathway. And the reason is that, that when carbon dioxide is absorbed from the atmosphere, it's made into an intermediate compound that has either three carbon atoms in it or four car carbon atoms. So we just call it a C3 or C4 that describes that first step in photosynthesis. And if we wander around the landscape and look at what is a C3 and C4 plant, the C3 plants are, um, in our particular diagram, everything on the left here. So this is a market in Ethiopia on the left, in the lower left. And so bananas and mangoes and uh, cherries and onions and tomatoes and all of those sorts of things are all C3 plants and use this photosynthetic pathway and all, virtually all trees on the planet. And they have this characteristic range of isotope values. Um, when it would, we'll not worry so much about what those values are. Minus 25 per mil just means it's 25 parts per thousand lower than the isotope standard. So we all think about our property tax rates, and we talk about those in per mil, and we're not so concerned except when they get too high. And we always think that we pay 25 per mil too much rather than too little. But it's just a small variation in the one decimal place beyond percents. C4 plants, on the other hand, turn out to be all the tropical grasses. So and what tropical grasses? Um, I show some on the lower right there. Uh, corn is a tropical grass. Sorghum is a tropical grass. Sugarcane is a tropical grass. So those plants use a different photosynthetic pathway, and we can easily tell the difference um, between them. So in my isotope world, had I stopped at a grocery store on my way here, I would, you know, every time I say C3, I'd hold up a package of you know, frozen beans and versus corn, okay? So that's really the distinction that is, you know, one that you can, can readily remember. But we can see these differences. So we can measure these differences in plants, and then we can measure them in uh, other things. So C3 plants are almost all the dicots. Those are the plants that when you, you know, do an experiment in, uh, seventh or eighth or ninth grade and you grow something, you plant beans, after about two weeks, two leaves come up. So that's why it's, that's a dicot. Okay? If you would have planted corn, one leaf would have come up. That's a monocot. Okay? So corn and so on. So um, in terms of the foods, when we go to the grocery store or we eat in a restaurant, um, we are eating either C3 plants or C4 plants. And uh, so next time you go to the market, uh, just try to categorize things in terms of C3 and C4. But remember that all of the sugar that goes into stuff in virtually every part of the United States except for Michigan uh, uses sugar cane. So Michigan has a big sugar beet industry. And that sugar is a C3 sugar. So there's a lot of fun experiments for us to do. 
So we can see this in our diet. And in fact, we could go, and we've done this. We've gone to all, not all, the McDonald's restaurants in North America, but <laughs> McDonald's restaurants in all the states. And so we've actually seen how much C3 and C4 ultimately is in the hamburger that we, that we have. And we can do that. So well, the way that I like to think about this, you are what you eat plus a few per mil. So that you are a little bit different than what your diet is. And what I want to do today is talk about the diets and drinking water of animals and what we can s tell about them using stable isotopes. So we were all told you are what you eat. So read carefully the ingredients. This is a biscuit, biscuit uh, box that I picked up in Pakistan. And their chemicals are just listed as just one of the ingredients. So. <laughs> So there you are. <clears throat> so about 20 years ago, I was going to go to Mongolia. And this was right after the Soviet Union had kind of collapsed. And, and uh, there was a scientific exchange being offered. I found out a long time ago when somebody says, do you want to go somewhere that you should just raise your hand? And so uh, I went to Mongolia on an expedition. And Mongolia at the time was not importing any other foods from anywhere. It was only eating locally, uh, local foods. And we were going to do a, a field trip around a good part of the country. We we're going to start in the capital, Ulaanbaatar, which is in the sort of big black writing there. And then we we're going to travel up to the north central part of the country to a lake called Lake Hufsagul, uh, where um, there are people who ride reindeers. Uh, and do all sorts of interesting Mongolian sort of things. And then we're going to drive back to Ulaanbaatar. And I thought to myself, this is a wonderful chance for an experiment. Um, and the experiment is me. And so what I'm going to do is sacrificing my body to science. I'm going to shave. Every day I'm going to shave my beard and I'm going to see what my diet history is as I I'm in the United States, and then as I go to Mongolia, and then I go to the field. And, and one of the things that's true in Mongolia is all of the grasses, there are C3 grasses because it's so cold. So I said that the C4 plants are the tropical grasses. So the cold season grasses, like Kentucky bluegrass that you like to have in your lawn, and like wheat and barley and rye are all C3 grasses. So the C4 grasses are tropical grasses like crabgrass that you don't like in your lawn. And they do very well in the summer here, I'm told, by some of the people. I know it works that way in Salt Lake City. <coughs> so in Mongolia, it turns out in the north, it's all. So these are grasslands, but they're C3 grasslands. And we ate what we could on this uh, trip, including, I you know, hadn't really realized it, but in in Mongolia, they milk their horses. And if you want to have horses milk beer, that's where you go. So, and if you'd like horses milk vodka because you want something stronger than beer, then that's where you go. You can get horses milk beer in Mongolia. So, um, and it's a C3 beer. <laughs> so this is, this is what happened in my experiment. Um, I was in Utah, and I dutifully shaved every day for about two weeks beforehand. And my children and I went camping, and we ate lots of lots of different foods. And if we look at this uh, record, we can see that while I'm in Utah, there's a lot of variation every day. Okay, and and even you know our agriculture system isn't as great as it is here in Southern California, but we do pretty good and we because we import stuff from here. But we have lots of choices and we eat different things every day and you could see that in my beard hair. Then I went to Ulaanbaatar and we were in Ulaanbaatar for about a week and we ate at the same restaurant every single day and it was really wasn't much choice. Um, and my diet was essentially, the beard was 
locked in at the same value. We went to the field and ate different food, but pretty much the same thing because we brought this huge wheels of cheese and some sausages and then we would buy local sheep. We found that money wasn't actually very useful because somebody told us that we should just bring bags of rice and we could trade rice for sheep, but they didn't really want money because they didn't have anything to spend it on. Um, and then we see that when I'm in the field and my field trip in the middle of the slide, it's a very different diet, it's some variation. Then back to Ulaanbaatar where my hair returns to its original value and then I get on an airplane, fly back to America and in one of the only times I've ever been on an airline that actually served corn chips, I, you know, flying out of Narita, I thought this is perfect, this is perfect for my experiment. So one of those points on there is a corn chip. <laughs> so this kind of led us to think, well this is, you know, th this was kind of fun and um, except for the shaving part, I don't like that part. But, but this is fun, but it really you know, suggests, well, we could do a lot. And so this started uh, several different research projects uh, that started in the next few years, and that's really what I'm going to talk about. But I guess my inspiration is this little fun field trip where we found really some interesting things happening. So um, long about this time, um, sort of in sort of my career, we had a magical event, and the magical event was that we got a large grant to do unlimited research for a few years, and we started a project between the geology and the biology departments, in which we did a series of controlled diet experiments. So I'm not going to go through the details uh, and show you the mathematical way to do these things because you probably wouldn't really like that. Um, but I will say that these were really, these and still to this day, these are about the only large animal diet experiments that people have done. Uh, so there's been a lot of stuff done on small animals like you can do in medical schools and colleges, but there's been, been very, very few large animal experiments. And it was this sort of this magical Packard Foundation grant that we had for a few years in which we could look at cows, pigs, horses, llamas, all sorts of large animals. And that inspired uh, actually an, an awful lot of ancillary research that we've been doing that's actually led to some studies on diabetes and how we use isotopes to study diabetes and, and other things. And it, it, it just always is a reminder to me that, that uh, real advances in research often are these really surprising events and collaborations with, with colleagues that, that you just don't anticipate. Um, so we fed animals things and, 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 and one of the, yeah, so in case you can't read, this, this animal's name was pig. <laughs> and we had pigs named cows and this was, <coughs> some, some people thought that was funny, so. <laughs> So we, we did it. Um, but uh, the bottom line is that in, if we feed animals an equilibrium diet, and we've done this on bison, we've done it on little, like I say, goats, rabbits, um, we've done it on some wild animals that are in fairly controlled situations, and we find a constant offset between the diet and hair, in this case the carbon isotopes in keratin compared to diet is systematically offset by, in this case, three per mil. Um, and so now we can go to work and, and we can try to now figure out ways to reconstruct diets. And we can do this with all sorts of tissues. We can do this with teeth. Tells you a slightly different story. Uh, we can do it with collagen, which is the, the organic tissues that are in bone. Um, and, uh, and so on. Enamel, by the way, uh, tells about what the conditions were like when the enamel formed, which turns out to be when you were growing up. So my teeth have a history of my two front teeth of about when I was two to three years old. So somebody would analyze those, they would say Chicago, Illinois, and my molar teeth 
also would say Chicago, Illinois. My hair would say Salt Lake City. So different tissues, and, and I'll get into that later when we talk about the NCIS component. So, so all of these tissues can tell us something about histories. So along about this time, I uh, was working in East Africa on early human evolution, and I was in one of the national parks collecting some, some stuff, and I went to the elephant orphanage. In Nairobi, there's a wonderful elephant orphanage where they take uh, orphan elephants and try to rehabilitate them to the wild so these uh, animals have been abandoned. Um, often now because their family has been killed by poachers and so sometimes they're left behind. Sometimes the animal will fall into a well and they can't, the family can't get it out and they have to leave. They're scared away and so the, the, uh, the Sheldrick uh, Trust um, takes these infants and tries to rehabilitate them. When they get older than infants, they're taken to another park. And that was the park I started working with. And I was sort of fascinated with the notion that we could use the hair of elephants to learn about diets. So the next part of my story is what I did with the Save the Elephants Foundation. And what's shown here is an elephant whose name is Winston. And Winston is wearing a GPS collar. So the little thing on the top of his head at his neck or just above his ear, that is a GPS collar. And you can see a little strap hanging down right below his ear. And that's the other end of the collar. And you can see these are big things. So this snaky thing here that's being held by four or five of us is the GPS collar. And it takes, it's not easy to put these on and they won't do it themselves for you. You have to, you have to knock them down and put on the collar. And when you do, as I said, every time that you, you know, do this, collect me a hair. So the tail hair on an elephant, again, I've kind of shown a close-up there. It's like a giant fan, and they use it just as a fan to get rid of flies and that sort of thing. And so we started this project in about 2000, and it's still going on today. Uh, we're still following this one family of elephants named the Royals. The Royals family, that's one of the members of the Royals family. Um, my two particular colleagues are George Wittemeyer and Ian Douglas Hamilton, who are working with us on this project, and the staff of the Save the Elephants Foundation. And uh, there's a permanent staff in the, in the area. But so every year for the last 12 years, or 14 years, we've gotten a hair from one member of the same family. So what we do is try to construct a long-term history. So this is a long tradition in geology. We do this by drilling cores in the ocean, and we, we try to match up these wiggles, and these wiggles are telling us things. What I've shown here are two isotopes, nitrogen-15 on the top and carbon-13 on the bottom. And the different colors represent different hairs. So the red hair is a hair from an elephant in the royals whose name was Queen Elizabeth. The royals family is named after royal queens of the past, Anastasia, Cleopatra, Victoria, and so on. So every elephant family, we're studying about 50 or 60 different, actually more than that, about 75 different families and every family Sort of, we have to give a name just so we can, you know, rather than talking about family 75, if we say, oh, the cheeses, then we all immediately think, oh, the cheeses has Gouda and Brie and Camembert and Cheddar. And the Royals has Queen Elizabeth and Anastasia and Cleopatra and Victoria and Queen Ma and Mary and so on. So uh, we match up these wiggles and we know what day we collect the samples. And you can see we've got a red line and a black line and a white line and a blue line. And so using these, we can actually determine the growth rates of the hairs. So the hairs grow at constant rates. And then we can match the wiggles. And then we know that, well, in every month of the year, every, basically we sample these at about a weekly resolution. So we get the diet of each animal 
Um, it's sort of about a weekly resolution. And then we just keep collecting basically all the way now to 2013. So the last sample we collected was actually about three months ago. Um, and so we have this long-term continuous record. So what can we do with it? And by the way, remember, these elephants are wearing GPS collars. So we can get something about their geographical information, where they are, and now what they are doing. So one of the other key players in this are the satellites that whiz around every night. And they measure, among other things, something we call NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. So this tells us how green the planet is. So the NDVI index in Riverside right now is really low compared to what it should be in, 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 in January. So this, uh, the return infrared and visible reflections coming back to that are measured on the satellite are quantified into basically the greenness of the planet below. So NDVI is a measure of this. And we'll just remember that up means green and down means brown. So what I'm showing here is the carbon isotope record compared to NDVI for a short period of time. Uh, and what I'm showing it compared to is five different families that we sampled over this two-year period. Um, and then we've, knowing what we know about the relationship between diet and hair and a little bit of mathematics, we can actually calculate the fraction of the diet that comes from the C4 grasses. So basically most, in the dry season, these elephants are browsers, they eat trees and shrubs. And then in the rainy season, as the grass begins to grow, for a while they eat grasses, but then they go back. So they, they, they're actually grazers, and they only get about 50% of their, even when they're grazing, only about 50% of their diet comes from the C4 grass. So there's a nice seasonal thing, and we're interested now scientifically in trying to understand, does these patterns change over time? Because we have long records that we can look at. So I said now we've got a 12-year record that we can look at from this family. Um, isotopes never lie. I analyzed a fourth elephant, and now I've put in the nitrogen isotopes, and you can see the nitrogen isotopes labeled B are pretty much constant for all of these Samburu resident families. And I analyzed another elephant. I didn't know anything about him except that his name was Lewis. And I said, I called my friend George Wittemeyer. I said, George, my mass spectrometer is broken. It's, it's giving me something very odd. It's either giving me a really low value or a value that's similar to the Samburu elephants, but it's really different. And he says, oh, well, that's because Lewis doesn't live in Samburu. <laughs> He lives somewhere else. In the, in the rainy season, he lives in Samburu, but the rest of the year, he lives in Mount Kenya, just like some Californians go off and have a vacation family home. So he goes to his mountain meadows in the, in the dry season. So he goes up to Mount Kenya. And we know when he does this because he's wearing a GPS collar. And so... In looking at the nitrogen isotopes, which is this value here, we see Lewis has these sudden jumps in nitrogen isotopes. So here's forest, I mean on Mount Kenya, then he is down in the desert in Samburu, back in the forest and so on. And when we look at his carbon isotopes, we see that, well, it kind of makes sense when he's in the forest, he's eating forest kind of foods. And when in the rainy season, he goes down to the desert and the other animals are eating grass, he eats grass too. And then he goes back to the forest and, and he does this a bunch of times. But one of the times when he's in the forest, according to the GPS and according to the isotopes, he's eating grass. 
So he's eating grass while he's up in the mountain high on Mount Kenya. So that's peculiar. <laughs> so we can ask, now we can get the GPS collar to help us. Now, this is different than streaking in college campuses. <laughs> but this is what it's called. <laughs> so Lewis is for a long time in the Amenti Forest in high on Mount Kenya at the bottom of the diagram. And his tracks are the purple lines. And those are about every 15 or 20 minutes apart. And we see that Lewis spends a long time in the Menti Forest, and then suddenly, at night, he makes basically what looks like a run and shows up in Samburu Reserve by 6 o'clock in the morning. And he's there for a long time where he's actually seeking out his lady friend. <clears throat> and then he's, after he's there for a couple of months, he suddenly turns around and streaks back. And <clears throat> so I remember saying to Ian, could you... His track looks like a really straight line. Could you fly me over that? I'd like to see that. And so that is his track. His track is that road. <clears throat> he takes the road. Why does he take the road? He's got to go 40 kilometers, 25 miles, and he's got to do it in the dark, and he's got to do it because if he doesn't, he'll be shot. Okay? So he's going through farm fields on his way in between. He's walking through Elephant Candyland. He knows he has to be back either inside Samburu Reserve or the Menti Forest by daylight or he's going to be a dead elephant. So he probably started this a long time ago when the distances weren't so great, but as the population area increased and you're farming more and more, all, basically all the space between the two reserves are now filled up with farms. So then the next question is, well, let's now look at Lewis in more detail because we did see that he was doing something. He was eating grass when he was up in the Amenti Forest. And you can see the Amenti Forest is the dark red area. And you can see that his tracks are in there about half the time. And we know when his tracks are because the GPS tell, not only tells us where he is but when he is. And we see that if we keep track of hours outside of the Amenti Forest, he is outside the forest only after dark, and he's back in the forest being a good little elephant by <laughs> 6 o'clock in the morning when the sun comes up. Pretty intelligent indeed. And so in the, in the daytime, he's in the forest, and in the nighttime, he goes out, and what do we see? He's out eating corn. <laughs> he's eating maize, so we figured out why when he's in the forest he can eat grass, because Corn is grass. <laughs> so he's a bona fide crop raider. And um, basically for about a almost two months period, he's eating on the average of about 200 pounds of grass of corn a day. <laughs> okay. And he's only, and we calculate he's eating about 40% of his diet is C4 plants. And he's outside, he's only outside the forest 40% of the time. <laughs> So, um, so we solved that mystery of how he could be in the forest eating grass. And it, it is actually for the first time that Kenya Wildlife Service was actually able to say, yes, we have to believe the farmers. This guy really was chowing down on their crops. And we can begin to think about how, whether we want to or not. We can begin to compensate the, the local farmers in an appropriate way. So it, it's not just hearsay. We can actually quantify the damage that these guys are doing. Um, so we can map this over a long time. And I show here just a six-year record of the Royals family. And you can see that when it gets green, they eat grass. And when it doesn't, they don't. And we see one time when they missed. And this was a real puzzle. Beautiful, good growing season. And this family did, was not grazing and, in fact, was eating something really quite different. What is the problem? So again, um, this is time to use our GPS information. 
And we find out that that's the only time that this animal, this group, left the park. And they were actually out competing with cattle during this time. And when cattle graze, they keep grass about this tall or less tall. And the way an elephant eats grass is the way you eat spaghetti. They wind it up. And if it's only that long, you can't eat spaghetti very easily, and they can't eat grass. <clears throat> so when they, they basically cannot compete with cattle, which has really important implications for land use in these areas where there's uh, increasing and changing population pressures. Um, elephants really, they, they, that, that's a resource they really want. Uh, it's a resource they clearly use when they can, and with changing land use patterns and increased crowding of things, it looks like that that resource is more and more restricted. So again, that's, that's a management decision, but we can make these decisions now and we can document that they really cannot use this resource uh, when they're in direct competition with cattle. So it's turned out to be a really kind of useful uh, management and understanding of the ecology, especially the ecology and the conflict. And there really is really important elephant-human conflict in, in much of Africa. Uh, and we can match these uh, things. This is just to show sort of how the rainfall corresponds to the, to the rainy season and the greening of the planet. And we actually see that the there's a delay of about between the the elephants don't even start grazing until there's the maximum greenness, and that's because it that's exactly how long it takes before the grass can get tall enough that they can actually use it with their traditional spaghetti type of dining on grass. So there's all of these time lags. We can now again quantify in ways that we hadn't been able to before, uh, because before it was sort of rather more, much more anecdotal. So it's been a really nice way to quantify a lot of issues. Uh, some of you might ask, well, how do hair and ivory compare? And this is a project that a, one of my graduate students just, uh, just finished. Uh, and um, this is Kevin Uno, uh, who's uh, just, just left my lab. And we were able to work on uh, two different elephants uh, one was one of these GPS collar-wearing elephant, and the other was really wonderful because it was a zoo animal that was transferred from Vallejo, California to Salt Lake City. And one thing, although with my Packard Foundation grant I could afford to do a bunch of cows and goats and pigs, there's no way that I can afford to do a diet switch on elephants. <laughs> and even harder to do a water switch. But we accomplished the same thing by just transferring animals between zoos and then trying to work with them. So um, this is the strategy we take. And uh, I won't go into the details, but <clears throat> the ivory has laminations that are about the width of a human hair, uh, 100 microns. And so we made milling striations at about those same those same scales, and it turns out that's actually about a week worth of time. Uh, there's finer laminations that we can actually see that are daily laminations, but we can't afford to to do that. We still, for this you know uh, elephant that lived for 50 years, um, there's an awful lot of striations that you can go in if you're doing this at a weekly weekly interval. So, so we um, we did what we could, uh, but we find a remarkable uh, correlation. So we see exactly the same record in the tusk dentine in the tusk as we see in the tail here. So that's the top two, top two scales. So that's the same animal with the elephant ivory and with the tail hair. So the top one is the ivory, the one below that is the tail. And you can see that the NDVI, they're lagging behind, both of them, the greenness index. And we've actually continued this back now about 20 years, um, but I'm just showing you this this little thing. So this is another opportunity that we have, um, and I'll just uh, just also say that one of the great tragedies that's going on in the world today is the slaughter of elephants and the elephant poaching problems, and 
and um, it's it's uh, they're, they're they're wonderful animals. And if you uh, haven't been to Africa, try to get there because they're not going to be there much longer. Last year, it's estimated about probably 50,000 elephants were killed. There's only 500,000 on the planet, so it's it's a it's a bad situation. Um, I'm often asked how you collect elephant hair. Uh, we knock them down. Uh, they're asleep for about 10 minutes. We do a variety of things, change the batteries in the collars, put a new collar on, collect tail hair, a bunch of other things. Sometimes there's some veterinary things that have to be done. Uh, don't do it the way that uh, this way. <laughs> My colleague George Wittemeyer was in that truck when he met this guy named Rommel. And um, yeah, as they say in the TV things, don't try this at home. This is experienced uh, driver needed. <clears throat> so now human hair. I want to spend the last bit talking about human hair. What can it tell us about location? Um, a colleague, a friend of mine uh, is a horse aficionado and she said, oh yeah, the horse uh, just moved from my barn uh, from Georgia. I said, well get me one of the tail hairs. So she did and we measured it this case for hydrogen isotopes. And we can see that, oh look, the, we can actually see that change because we changed the water source. So hydrogen and oxygen isotopes in water. So water is not all the same. Okay? Isotopically, we can map water. This is a graduate student who moved from Salt Lake City uh, Be Beijing, China to Salt Lake City and we analyzed her hair. We can see the change in oxygen and deuterium isotopes. And we can look at different cities around the world. So this map also shows the different cities. Salt Lake City, Beijing, Finland, Kenya, London. So there's a possibility of using human hair for geographic travel. So one of the projects that we've done is to measure drinking water from <clears throat> about a thousand cities, actually two thousand cities in the United States. And so this map just shows the oxygen isotope distribution. Blue is means that there's very little deuterium in the water. And red means that there's a lot. So we have this nice pattern. <clears throat> and then we thought, well, let's do this with hair. Let's maximize our travel. And so my colleague Jim Elringer and I uh, said, well, we, I said to my two kids, just go on a driving trip, stop in barber shops, collect hair. And uh, uh, Jim uh, Elringer's wife, Edna Elringer, and a friend drove through the southern United States and just went to barber shops and collected hair. Just stuff off the floor. And so then we could, well, my daughter then took lots of pictures and because she says, Dad, this is a crazy country. There's just all kinds of neat things that you don't expect in little towns in North Dakota, like elephants wearing glasses. <laughs> uh, but now we, can fi we find that we, there's an offset, but we find that the people in central Texas that have the highest uh, concentrations of oxygen 18 and deuterium in water also have the highest concentrations in their hair. And the same is true the ones that are the most negative in northern Montana have the most negative values in their hair. And so now we can construct an isoscape uh, human hair provenance map. So we can now say, okay, well now we can begin to say something about about travel histories. And so I'm going to just, in sort of my last example will be a study that we worked on for some years. There's a uh, case that uh, came to our attention about six or eight years ago. I don't remember exactly. A little longer, maybe ten years ago. Uh, it was uh, some hair, skull, and some bones were found near Salt Hair, Utah. Um, it was um, it was a young woman, and we didn't know very much. We used the bomb carbon-14 dating, so it's a different story. 
But we could say, well, this woman died in about 1990, and she was about 20 years old. And uh, that was really all we could say. And so we took her hair, and we wanted to get a detailed history. And to actually analyze a single hair, we need about an inch or so of hair. And so that's, that's too much time. So we wanted a better time. So we took about 30 hairs, and we lined them all up and glued them together at the end and put them through a long tube and then chopped them up finely so we could get a better time resolution. And, um, well, as an aside, there's some things you should know about hair. One is that the growth rate is about constant. It's about one inch every two months, a centimeter a month. Um, human hair has two principal growth stages. It grows continually at a constant rate, but that it's different. The hairs right next to each other will have a slightly different growing rate. <clears throat> and for about four to six years, it grows and then it stops. And then it waits. And then it eventually falls out. And that's what comes out when you're combing your hair, this hair that's in the resting stage, the catagen stage. And the hair that you grab and you pull it and it hurts when it comes out, that's the active growth rate. It sits in this resting stage for six or seven or eight months. And so when we analyzed this young woman's hair, we had this mixture of hairs that could have these different histories. So <clears throat> we were puzzled because we were stuck on this case for a long time. And I'll get to the results in a second. But <clears throat> finally, I said I had a math graduate student who wanted to do a rotation in my lab. And I said, OK, Chris. Um, uh, this is a problem that we have. We've got this mixed isotope signal, and we need to unmix it. And so he really did some elegant things, and he said, okay, let's, let's reconsider this. And so this figure shows that if we consider a distribution of growth rates, so we take a constant growth rate, plus or minus 10%, so some are growing a little faster, some are growing a little slower, and some fraction, 7%, which is what we have in humans, are in the resting stage. So they're just random junk noise. What does it look like? And this figure shows that the first one, labeled A, shows that after two and a half months, everything is still pretty closely bunched together. But as we get further and further away in time, this signal gets smeared out more and more. So this sharp spike after about two years is really, really, really attenuated. We can't do much with it. So I said, OK, Chris, that's what we have. Now let's run the thing backwards. And what can we do? And I'll just show you some examples. We took, <clears throat> we, the, we'd like to consider that, well, if we take a primary signal. So we had some really, we had some great examples with elephant hair because we can sample them so finely. So we can say, OK, let's take an elephant here and sample it really finely. And then we'll, we'll pretend that we had 30 of them, that we mixed the signal together. <clears throat> and that's what this A, B, and C shows. And the A is what it really looks like. And C is what it looks like <clears throat> after about two years. The signal is really badly degraded. And we said, OK, Chris, let's, let's, let's now apply this to this salt air sally case. We're going to take this signal that we know that we mixed, but now we've got a way to unmix the signal. And so this is our original story before I had Chris do this work. So we analyzed the hair. And we have what we call region 1, region 2, and region 3. And it looks like this woman was going from the green area, Salt Lake City, to somewhere we know is colder, based on the isotopes, Yellowstone Park region, then back to Salt Lake City, then somewhere close to, but a bigger target area than Yellowstone Park, then back to Salt Lake City. So this 
woman is going back and forth. So then we said, but Chris, that's we know this is a mixed signal. Do it again. Now let's see what it really looks like. So this enter Chris Ramin and do your magic. And he does his magic, and we find out there's a new search area we're called region four that kind of pops out. And I thought to myself, God, this maybe this is just a mistake, but maybe it's not a mistake. So we <clears throat> talked to the Salt Lake City Police and said, well, okay, we've been working on this for five years. We're, we haven't gotten anywhere, but now we've got this new information. So Salt Lake City Police calls Portland, Seattle corridor and says, is there a missing person who disappeared about such and such a time? And the answer is yes. So um, uh, this, this young woman, about a year before she died, visited her mother in Seattle. And, uh, and it's kind of a sad case, but it's actually a, an NCIS that actually worked. It doesn't happen nearly as fast as on the television programs, <laughs> uh, which is usually about 30 minutes. So we were involved in this case actually for about five or six years. And we've been involved in a number of um, other cases, um, some of which we've been able to help solve, some of which we've been called in to corroborate other possible scenarios, and some of which are still left um, standing. Um, but that's kind of the way things go. So uh, in summary, um, uh, we can do some interesting things. And um, I hope I've given you uh, an evening that you've enjoyed, <laughs> uh, learning about how we can use natural variations on our planet to learn about how animals, including humans, behave. Thank you. <clears throat>- Okay, the, so the question is what is the connection between um, the C3 or C4 plants and the carbon isotope ratios? Um, it, it turns out that the C4 plants are a relative um, addition, as it were, to plant life on Earth. So they've been here for a very short time compared to um, all the other photosynthetic pathways. We're simply using it as a tracer, but as it happens, ecologically it's very important since the C4 plants uh, uh, are the tropical grasses, and in particularly for humans, that means we can actually have a really good tracer for corn, sugarcane, and, and those sort of things. So the reason why there's a difference between the two of them is a little bit um, complicated, and I, I might be, if you're really interested, I can talk to you about that afterwards. <laughs> might be easier, but basically, um, it's a different biochemical pathway, and so we end up with a different isotope difference between carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the plant itself. Yeah. Um, are there any other places other than hair on the body where you can track a person's location? Um, yeah, so the question is, I'm partly repeating this because I'm part of this is being recorded and so um, some of that, the questions need to be recorded. Um, so the question is, are there other parts of the body that you could use for different things? So one of the things are teeth. So teeth tell about your history when you're a child because the teeth don't remodel over time. So the isotopes uh, sort of stay put, as it were. And so my teeth tell my where I was in a child. And if you would analyze my teeth, you would say, this kid grew up near Chicago, <laughs> which I did. And, uh, and I didn't move very much as a child. I'd probably expect, you know, I, I, I don't want to see the results of this 
myself, but I would expect that all of my teeth would look really similar because we didn't go anywhere as a kid. Um, <clears throat> but someone who moved, say, from Chicago to Houston, Texas, when they were in third grade, we should see those kind of changes. So this has been used, for instance, in, in archaeological um, excavations, say, for instance, in the Middle East, where uh, there's a burial. And they say, well, are, were these the Europeans who were attacking the, you know, who were the crusaders? Uh, or were these the defenders of the city? So this has been used uh, quite a bit. So there, you, what you need to know is what the rules are for each of the tissues, and then hopefully ask your question and try to answer the question that, that that's suitable for. Good question. I just was curious. You, every day you shaved. So every day the hair was different. Did you did eating differently each day? And what if, if you let it grow, like your beard is now or longer, would you be able to identify all the different areas where you ate differently? You'd, you'd be able to identify if you could sample that finely. And that's the problem. With a single hair, you have to be able to chop it up so that you could get actually a daily resolution. So the advantage of the shaving was that I know that that stuff, that was the stuff that you know showed up after one day. And so I could mix many, many hairs together and get enough to analyze. So it would be very hard to do on a single hair unless you're an elephant. And so on an elephant, we, 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 we've done the resolution in a single day. And we can see the changes, and then we often need to know some other information to know exactly what they mean. If I understand this correctly, uh, you can tell um, what a person has been based on the food they're eating because that food grows in these different regions. Uh, if that's if I'm getting that right, um, but c would there be like some contamination because food transported long distances? Like say I was eating corn from South America, and I mean, would you have two regions in the world where? you're having the same, like, identical um, match. So that you would think, like, oh, maybe this person was in Europe, but actually they were in South America or, or some other continent. Is, could that happen if food is being transported in all different sorts of places? Mm, okay, so the question is, um, um, how, what, what do you do about uh, the problem of the same food growing in different locations? Uh, or being transported uh, due to trade. Uh, yeah, that is a real valid concern, and that's why on the map that is in, that's showing on the screen right now, we try to say, well, these are all the areas in the United States that satisfy, in this case, the, the oxygen isotope composition of this woman's hair. So we, we didn't know that it was Seattle, but we knew that you know, it was not Salt Lake City, it was not Los Angeles, it was restricted to a, a, a certain area. So, so what we try to do is say, well, we, we can't actually say where something was from, but we can say, we can eliminate 98% of the world. And so we, have, we still have a fair footprint left behind, but so we do have that concern. Now, um, your, your other question had to do about the trade of food. And with, uh, there, there's two things. One is for the geographical location, we do much better with oxygen and hydrogen isotopes because that's about drinking water. And the water usually is fairly local and you say, oh, I drink Coke. Well, the Coke that you buy in Riverside was bottled in Riverside. So, and when you may, well, I drink lots of coffee. Well, coffee turns out you probably got the water out of the tap. So it still looks like tap water. Um, and so other, where isotopes have been used to look at this trade question, there's some really interesting studies that some others have done. For instance, to look at, at um, the changes in diets over long time periods of some populations where 
we can look at uh, over uh, since uh, World War II and beyond, especially some of the Inuit uh, populations in Canada, Alaska, and Greenland. And we can actually see large changes in those populations um, in the isotopes in the hair because of imported foods. So it's something, yes, we have to worry about. And it, it does represent, um, it just represents a different challenge. So we, one of those issues, you have to be aware of it. And once you're aware of it, then you build that into your interpretation. More contemporary note: uh, Is hair analysis important in uh, your knowledge in the uh, the sports doping uh, situation with uh, you know, Lance Armstrong and the New York and the Yankees and so forth? Um, I can't say about uh, okay. So the question is: uh, Is hair uh, isotope and other analysis um, used in some of the sports? doping and other issues. I cannot say whether isotopes have been used in the case of Lance Armstrong or Alex Rodriguez, uh, but I can say that Floyd Landis, yes. <laughs> um, so uh, there's uh, not in the way that I've uh, done them, but you can uh, sometimes extract, and again, here on this campus, uh, there's some really nice work being done on uh, individual organic molecules uh, and the isotopes are used. Uh, we can tell, for instance, whether the testosterone uh, in your blood is compatible with you having made it or you having bought it. <laughs> so yes, it, 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 it's a, it is a very important test in, um, <clears throat> in the sports industries. I speak as a retired professor of the history of art. And one of the things I remember very clearly was that there was a scientist who came to annual conventions and he revealed the fact that in the fifth century before Christ, there was a great change in diet. And in fact, he went on to paint a kind of horror story as to what happened to human teeth after the fifth century before Christ. Before that, the food was much rougher and you chewed a lot. And after that, you didn't have such problems, or rather, you had different problems. <laughs> and I wondered if, in your research, uh, you had taken time into question. Um, yeah, so the question, the question is, um, have I taken time in 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 my research um, with with an example of of how some uh, historical diet changes at about the end of the Ro uh, time of the Holy Roman Empire, um, it uh, so to answer your question, we've we've actually been working on diets of early human of of humans throughout the 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 fossil record of humans. My work has principally been based actually on on either fossils, quite old fossils, um, or, um, uh, or trying to understand modern human and animal ecology. So I personally have not actually worked very much on the archaeological use of stable isotopes with respect to civilizations, but um, others have. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your, your, the, your, your question. But time is, is certainly one of the, you know, 
it's the one thing that, that, that all geologists agree about is, is most important. We don't agree on any, much of anything else, but we all <laughs> really respect time. <clears throat> Thank you for a great presentation. On the slide with the Mongolian diet, your Mongolian diet, has there been any link between the C4, C3, the part of the C4 and C3, and health concerns? Am I, I'm coming from the, most of our diet here seems to be corn-based in most products. Um, so the question is, uh, has to do with uh, the possibility of using isotopes and studying uh, problems with human health. And um, so the answer to that is there, there are some things you can do. We're actually involved in a study uh, with a national children's study um, in which we were um, working with uh, different students to uh, see how uh, how different diets were related with respect to um, school lunch programs, and we could act, so we would actually be one of the things that is very uh, nice and, un and, and not an in in invasive is that uh, breath, your human breath tells you about what you're metabolizing right now, and so. And so all we need to do is get people to blow up a balloon, and we can say something about some of their diet aspects. And some of that has to do with, you know, how long it is that you've been fasting and you know, what your response is than if you, you know, are given a little bit of a, a sugar dose. So there, there's a number of human health things that actually have immediate, uh, immediate things that We've done some work on, and others have done some work on. Um, there's some people up in Alaska who've been really studying the Native American populations in Alaska with the concern about, well, it's a very big change in the traditional diet, which was hunting and gathering, and now there's a lot of uh, imported food that's coming in that's much higher in, in, in corn-based products, in, and especially in sugars. So there, there's a... There's great possibility there, and there's a few groups that are that are doing it. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, I, like all you guys said, join me. And thank you. <laughs> <laughs>